Let's stay down the line. Richard Hawley, tonight the streets are ours. Excellent stuff. Peter Kerr is online at present, but a reminder, if you just tuned in, you're listening to the Midrick Drive Morning Edition on Siren 107.3 FM. We have in the studio Steve Court. Hello, Steve. Hello. We have Katie Grimerson. Hello, Katie. Hello. We have the amazingly talented Randy Reinhouse. How are you, Randy? Hi. We have the equally amazingly talented and somehow always choreographed to perfection, Rosie Langhorn. How are you, Rosie? I'm fine, thank you. And we have the wonderful, superlative uh, creator of Caitlin O'Shaughnessy and more, the fabulous Jean Bruce Scott. How are you, Jean? I'm fantastic. Ed Wellman has gone out for a bit of oxygen. It's all right. It's understandable. Peter, if you're ready uh, and you've caught this uh, this show so far, you might have wondered what, as one of the Lincoln-inspired patrons, the jingle for the Lincoln-inspired festival this year, 7th to the 12th of May is all about. Would you like to hear it again? Yes, I would. Lincoln Inspired is more than just an arts festival, more than a literary festival, more than a whole set of lifestyle opportunities, and more than what the world has needed for millennia. To see just how much more Lincoln Inspired can make you, go to lincolninspired.co.uk and explore the inspiration. I thought the way Jean captured the British accent when she actually did that run <laughs> was just frankly astounding. <laughs> you know, Dick Van Dyke, eat your heart out. We just, just don't know where we're going on that. It's true. You agree with that. So, are you happy with that, Peter, as one of the inspirational patrons behind Lincoln Inspired? Well, yeah, I, I think it, it sums the whole thing up nicely, doesn't it? It's, uh, and, you know, joking apart, it's, it's a fantastic achievement that Sarah Broomer and her chums have... Um, I've pulled off in just, just, just a year, isn't it? Since well, we like to think so, don't we, Steve, really? I yeah. think we, we've done a very good job. I mean, you know, we like to feel uh, that we are one of Sarah, the Sarah Bullimore's chums, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we did actually co-host a literary quiz, which we've, we feel sort of added to the whole quality of the whole system. Sarah will be joining us hopefully later on. Uh, Rosie, a number between 1 and 400, please. Uh, 378. 378. Well, we're going straight to that for our little mini sight reading test from that perspective. He's obviously gone right to the end of the Song of the Eight Winds here, so it's going to hopefully no spoilers from this perspective, but uh, see how, how things manifest from this point of view. Meanwhile, Salima was urging Lucky the donkey on with little clicks of her tongue, her impatience to see her parents again becoming more difficult to contain the nearer she got to home. Sensing this, Neddy ran ahead, barking excitedly. When Pedrito and the panting, wheezing Tranquilla caught up with them, Salima was standing just over the brow of the ridge, staring down into a ribbon of land enclosed by the curved flanks of the hill rising up steeply on the far side. It was indeed a fine, sheltered place for grazing sheep, and fertile too, judging by the lush green sword growing between random strands of almond and olive and carob. In the centre of the valley, a whitewashed house nestled cosily amid a huddle of small barns and livestock enclosures. As was the custom in rural Mallorca, two tall palms stood guard at the entrance to this simple farmstead. It reminded Pedrito of his own home, and he could understand now why Salima had waxed lyrical so often about this entrancing place. Why, then, was she standing here looking so perplexed? Surely, Pedrito said, this was the moment she had been dreaming of for so long. So why wasn't she rushing down there to give her parents the most pleasant surprise of their lives? It's the smoke from the chimney, Sabrina replied uneasily. Pedro looked towards the house. But there isn't any smoke. Exactly. No sheep either. Well, it's been a warm day, so maybe they haven't bothered lighting the fire. Pedrito was trying to put as positive a slant as he could on the situation. And as for the sheep, well, maybe your father's grazing them further up the hill somewhere. But Sabrina was far from persuaded. She shook her head. No, it gets really cold at night up here at this time of year. Mother would have lit the fire hours ago. Does that does that kind of capture the, be- the piece, Peter, to a certain extent? Yeah, I, you know, it's like the last time you read, read one of these pages, Alex. I think I'm going to have to, to, to have you roped in to do the, the audio version of this book. For well, as a special treat, I'm going to actually present uh, Rosie with this Song of the Eight Wings to actually take away and read in full oh, because I think wow. it's a classic 10 out of 10 scenario. And it gets wow. even better because also because I wanted to introduce the, 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 the team gradually to the, the work of, of Peter Kerr, and obviously, well, I need to obviously purchase some more copies from this point of view, because they are so dedicated. I thought we'd start off Randy and Jean with Snowball Oranges, One Majorcan Winter, 
So there we are, your very own Peter Coe book that's sort of there to take across the Atlantic. Are you happy with that, Peter? So we're spreading the book word here from your point of view. <laughs> Alex, you know, you know that the 10% is on its way to you. Even <laughs> 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 you know, because I like to think like a, like a br- li- living, breathing delight that even though, you know, Randy and Jean might not be able to, to be part of the Lincoln Inspired Festival this year, they can at least take away the whole thing. So let's go to Snowball Oranges first, and we'll return to, to uh, Song of the Eight Winds, which, of course, as I said, the historical epic which I was outstanding. Equally found from a totally different angle, Snowball Oranges, equally as outstanding. Would you like to explain to Jean and Randy what they're going to be reading as they're perusing this as they cross the Atlantic and so on? Yeah, well, Snowball Oranges, is, it's, a, it's a true account. It's, it's the first of, um, I, think, I think, five books that I wrote about um, my and my family's experiences while trying to grow oranges for a living on a little farm in the, in the mountains of, of Majorca. And I'm sure that Jean and Randy know where Mallorca is, even if they don't know where... Let, no, no I'm going to say, even if they're Americans. No, yes, I thought <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just test this. Jean Bruce got Mallorca. Spain. Nice, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> ten out of ten. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, but that, don't that. ask me to find it on the globe. <laughs> <laughs> Could well, we ask you to find the United States on the globe, though? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Mm. No. Okay. <laughs> there may even be somewhere in the States called Mallorca. I, I don't know. But anyway, we, we went to the Spanish one, um, having farmed a bit in, in East Lothian here in Scotland and squeezed out by the the uh, recession of, of, of the early 80s. And we, we, we found ourselves really by uh, on an impulse in, in Mallorca, buying a, a little rundown orange farm in, in the mountains. And... Um, we just got stuck into it with, with our two sons. One was 10, the other one was about 18 or something at the time. And um, we knew nothing about oranges at all and uh, barely spoken any Spanish. And the adventures and misadventures started the day we arrived when it actually snowed in New York, the first time for, well, in living memory, I think, uh, as if the weather had um, had come from Scotland to welcome us. <laughs> and we, we had great fun. We were there for, 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 for three years. And these five books... Um, uh, an account, a, a true account, but a light-hearted one of, of the ups and downs of, of our times in New York. And Snowball Oranges is the first one. Hope, hope you enjoy it. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Now, we're looking at the Peter right. Kerr official website uh, of, obviously, the best-selling Scottish author. And as frequently said, you've had an epic life in your own routine. Born in the Moorish uh, uh, fishing village of Lossiemouth, uh, since early childhood lived on and off in the uh, agricultural county of East Lothian. Uh, you've been a music producer. You've been a top uh, jazz musician. Uh, you've worked your way through that. You've been a farmer. You're now an ace writer. You're now, of course, uh, a Lincoln-inspired patron and regular Scottish correspondent for the Midweek Drive. Um, so let's just open it. Rosie, questions for Peter, because you've got to say his latest text there, Song of the Eight Winds. Um, what do you want me to do, Alex? Just ask, ask a few questions. Yeah, yes, it, really? okay. Yeah. I suddenly Same thought you wanted me to read something. No, and then speed reading, we're covering that next week. Peter, hello. Hi, Rosie. Um, Peter, why did you go to Spain in the first place? What, what uh, drove you there? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, we had been taught squeezed out of the farming business in Scotland because we were too small to be viable, really. And um, when you're worried about these things, as I was, uh, how we're going to feed, feed the wife and kids, mm. what you do is you often holiday to Mallorca, don't you? Which yes. Is what, which <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, so that um, was your inspiration from, from well, your yeah, holidays? I went across with my wife and we got lost one day driving through the mountains. I was driving and guess, guess who was map was in? <laughs> <laughs> pre sat nav <laughs> Yeah, and uh, no, no sat there, then, yeah, no. Yeah. And, um, and we just stumbled upon this, this little farm in the mountains that was for sale, and we were shown about it by the way. She didn't speak, the woman who owned it didn't speak English, and we spoke very little Spanish. But somehow, after half an hour, we had agreed to buy the place, and uh, <laughs> that, that was it. And it was a, a completely life-changing uh, experience for us. And one, as I say, which, um, which led to all sorts of adventures and misadventures and, and a series of five books. Okay. And what were you farming when you were in Scotland? In Scotland, we, we were growing barley. Which oh, was growing for, barley. Uh, yeah, malting barley for making whiskey and beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, so and very we, different to suddenly have oranges. Well, yeah, to- totally different, yeah. yeah, because we had livestock in Scotland too. Which flavor the whiskey, were, I suppose. Uh, beef, beef cattle. And uh, well, the only livestock that we could have had in, uh, in, in, in Mallorca uh, would have been a pig, because these little farms... Then, that's, that, that was in the mid-80s, each little farm always kept its own pig. 
Yeah, see, it, it, it's, it's really things. literally just like San Diego, isn't it, G? You know, I mean, it's that, that sort of just sort of oranges and all the rest of the bits and pieces. There. And pigs. We have pigs in the backyard <laughs> with our chickens. Everybody have a pig in San Diego, yeah, <laughs> in, the back, in the back garden. Very, but very they, But they, they did in New York and, uh, even then. And, um, and that, well, you, you know, it was just a completely different way of life. And uh, although we had our troubles, and they're all explained in the books. And it, it is a classic read. I won't spoil any spoilers, Jean, but I'll be amazed if when we connect with you again, you haven't thought this is an outstanding thing. Uh, it's only one tragedy. It's not really a Native American voice, so it's difficult to actually get it into production. But I'm sure we could. We could, get, we could do a Native American version of it, really. But, but it's actually a very good, probably, cautionary tale, because I keep telling Randy I want to move out into the country and ah, well, buy a, buy a, a well, avocado farm. Yeah, yeah, or an yeah. orange so grow. you see <laughs> the universe is provided uh, Peter you're probably far too young to remember the series Top of the Pops but uh, if, you, if you can remember that sort of setup etc do you remember Legs and Co? yeah and in fact I, I sort of predate all that stuff predates it, it, yes. in, the, in the 1960s I was a professional jazz musician in London yep. oh wow um, yeah and we used to do uh, loads of tellies uh, Thank You Lucky Stars I think I think probably came before Top of the Pops isn't it was it you remember that? No, uh, you thank remember. you. It's amazing. What was it called? Thank your lucky stars. Yes, that does ring a bell. Yeah. Well, there we yeah. are. You see. Anyway, that little noise, which isn't a flatulent jingle, uh, despite the fact that it could be leading to two minutes of verbal wish, we flash, takes us to the news. So, Katie, last two questions for Peter Kerr, please. Peter, have you had a reasonably interesting telephonic link with us today? It's been fantastic as usual, Katie. Thanks. And can we look forward to connecting with you in the near future? You bet. Look after the tooth, Peter. I know it's going to be a tough day, but it'll work out well in the end. And remember, oh, Peter Kerr, I'm sure it's a taste of Spain, 7pm, the bowl for Tapas Bar. Plus, of course, if you're a woman in rural enterprise, Lincoln Wire, <laughs> uh, Monday, May the 13th, uh, that's at the Epic Centre. And, Peter, we look forward to welcoming you to Lincoln Inspired. Thanks very much, Alex. Look forward to that myself. This is Jane Clark, the historian at Aintree Racecourse, and you're listening to the Midweek Drive Morning Edition with Alex Lefchuk. Yeah, strangely so, how that sort of just decides to actually just have a slight delay there. Anyway, welcome to the Midweek Drive Morning Edition, and uh, a weather check as far as the Lincoln is concerned. Steve hasn't realised the microphone's live, so don't worry, we'll get that thing sorted through. Uh, six degrees centigrade is the high, four degrees centigrade is the low. It's going to be cloudy uh, later on today with rain and drizzle spreading northerly. OK, so uh, life continues in its own marvellous little way, and Rosie, um, I know you dancing routine is fantastic in every sense of the word. As I was saying yesterday, and indeed frequently said, if you want to have a 21st century equivalent to taking the ethos of Legs & Co and the quality that uh, Legs & Co obviously brought to the world and the planet uh, through so many of those wonderful routines, one thing you can add, horses. Oh, horses no. and gymnastics. No, Alex, I'm afraid oh, oh, I haven't oh, got oh, a clue oh, oh, oh. Well, about the horsey world. You uh, may, you, you may not, you, uh, you, you may not. not. Rebecca Townsend does, and we welcome Rebecca Townsend, our very own jive pony equine gymnastics specialist. How are you, Rebecca? I'm very well, thank you, Alex. Rosie, let me enlighten you. You need a horse. Yeah. <laughs> 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 thank you for that, Rebecca. That Critical. probably is what I need. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> So we've identified that to start off with. They have many legs on a dance show, let's face it, and they've got an extra couple of pairs, so you can't go wrong. Oh, oh, exactly. You know, <laughs> it's critical. Why you didn't actually introduce horses into the Top of the Pop studio, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was some sort of health and safety <laughs> thing, but, you know, most, most bizarre. I mean, it sounds most, like it could most, be. most peculiar. I think uh, it's probably something to do with children and animals, isn't it? Something like that. Yes, that sounds like... Something works uh, along those ways. But uh, share with us, uh, Rebecca, in terms of... You've obviously got Randy Reinholtz from Native American Voices. I mean, Randy, you're, are you a keen um, rider and, and sort of horse coordinator? I can stay on a horse. I'm not a particularly good rider. So much like myself, really. <laughs> I can stay on it, but, you know, pretty much it, really, for the level. So, but it was last week, Rebecca was keen to actually get me to do some equine gymnastics. Uh, no, I'm still keen. I'm still keen this week. Yeah, well, you see, I've told you, I'm, I'm not going to do the tutu uh, routine, because that's, that's just, you know, people... Are, you know, I think, Alex, I think you're using the tutu as an excuse. You we think can, so? You know, you don't have to wear the tutu. We can oh. put you in some lycras. I, I think... Yeah. I can see this happening. A nice lycra yeah. cat suit. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I think it's, I uh, think who knows what could happen when we connect at the CLA Game Fair in Warwick Castle? But it could be it could be almost as exciting as going down a, a, an outdoor cave at uh, the Yorkshire Game Fair. Never mind. Uh, Jean, horse riding and such like. Are, are you, are you, are you, are you, what do you think about horse winter equine gymnastics now? I'm embarrassed to say that the one time I had to ride a horse on Airwolf, oh. they gave me lessons. Yes. 
learn as much as I could. Yes. And they ended up putting me on the top of a ladder. No. <laughs> and filming all of my <laughs> things on top of a ladder. They put so. Kate and Sean on Yes. Yes. So I had to pretend to be riding a horse on the top of a that, ladder. That's Gangnam <laughs> style. <laughs> yeah, that is Gangnam style. You know, uh, twenty years before, it's, yes, it's phenomenal. Yes. That's yes, fantastic. You must have needed a jaunty camera angle to get to get the realism into that. Yes, exactly right. And I had a great uh, stunt woman who did all my tricks. I was supposed to be a trick writer. So thing is with the thing is with vaulting, Jean, is you have a a, a great big pad. And you have a, a lovely pair of handles, and uh, usually the horse is being controlled by somebody else, so it's a lot easier. Very good. Yeah. I could do that, maybe. Oh. Yeah. It's just when you start going upside down, things get complicated. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, so, so, and listen, Re- Rebecca, you don't, does, you, you don't just do it upside down. You, sort of bat, you, do it, you do it with microphone in hand. You do full commentary, <laughs> etc. It is a tour de force. As we saw, I mean, Ed, you, you're still impressed by the videos, are you not? Certainly am. Yes. Yeah. Morning, so, Rebecca. So, so let's let's move this further forward, Rosie. Let's let's talk about because obviously we need. I, I feel that after having conquered your fear of terriers earlier in the show, <laughs> I have been on a horse actually, Rebecca. I've got. I am fibbing slightly, mm, mm. and I've been trekking. Yeah, well, so that was very enjoyable. Yeah, exactly. But I don't really understand the sort of the whole horse box and everybody arrives at a at a, a festival of mm. horses and mm. they're jumping and mm. it's just right, I right. mean it must be exciting to be part of but I just never have been part of anything like well, that well the thing is Rosie I'm not actually <clears throat> a very horsey person not in the traditional sense because I ran away uh, and joined the circus as a Canadian <laughs> so I was in the circus for 3 years and uh, and I I'm actually not that horsey I just really really like them yes. so I don't have all the all the gear, but... <laughs> but you see, th- th- that's the reason, Becky, why you're regular on the midweek drive, because we can't be doing with <laughs> all that time and all the rest of the sort of bits. And it's not, it's, <laughs> you, it's, it's not, it, you know, there's a horse, and they're wonderful in their own routine, but, you know, we need to have that balance. And I the, completely uh, agree. Yeah. I completely agree. And the bit that really fascinates me about my job, because I'm one of those lucky people that, you know, gets to do a job that I love, I love the training of the horses because it's, a, it's really about the communication with a, with a different species. So, for example, all of our horses, they sit down, they lie down, they catch things, they count. And, and that's the funny thing. That's what people really like to see in our show. Yes, they like all the bouncing, bouncing on and off and the acrobatics and the upside down. But what they really like is when we say something to the horse and the horse understands us. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So many casting directors, you know, when you're working with a native American voice, you think, look, you know, are you a horse? You know, I'd have better sense with that if I was trying to say, what's, what's it going to do? <laughs> we haven't mentioned, of course, uh, Rebecca, that uh, Jean and Randy have come to us uh, from uh, California where they had a sensational success with The Birdhouse. Um, so, Randy, as you, as you talk, you, you were acting in The Birdhouse, produced, of course, by Jean Bruce Scott. Just share with us what, what was The Birdhouse all about, keeping the animal theme going. Uh, Birdhouse had no horses, no. but we were in Texas. And uh, it was a small town that was falling apart, uh, disintegrating, being uh, co-opted by big business. And the people uh, in our play were incapable of adjusting or dealing with the change. They wanted things to stay the same. And, of course, they didn't. So it didn't end well. Change the natural routine. But I'm I'm thinking here... They quite like that, though, aren't they? Oh, no, that's a very big generalization. Um, I, I work in Disneyland as well, in the Wild West show, mm. where they try and keep everything incredibly real. And we've got some wonderful Texan cowboys there. But <laughs> For example, one of my best friends in the show, who sometimes plays Buffalo Bill, he's a, he's a Texan. He's lived in France for 20 years, and he still doesn't speak French, which I completely rib him about all the time. <laughs> Maybe Texans are slightly inflexible. I'm, I'm beginning to get this vibe. Uh, I, mean, you know, I suppose y'all come back now. It's not going to necessarily... <laughs> translate too much from the body but I'm, I'm thinking actually Jean and randy that you know surely what california needs is uh jive pony more jive pony to actually get over there and actually perform. i mean i think that, jive know. pony sounds fantastic i would yeah. love to get it to california yep so there we are you see this, this is where it starts you see the the global domination of the midweek drive morning edition and midweek drive of course and jive pony what what, what oh, questions well, have you, I, have I you got rebecca peter kerr was going to have to put your commission in the post i think i am too aren't i <laughs> <laughs> I just think there's a way in which you can get things together, and Rosie, don't think you're escaping because I think those dance routines, the one you came up with last <laughs> night, is the definite line oh, on that. Oh, I thought there was a catch. Yeah. <laughs> Steve will be up in, in all sorts of ways. Rebecca, any questions you want to ask the team at this stage? 
I don't think so. I think I'm all right. Oh, all right then. Steve, questions for Rebecca, because I don't think you've had some exp- uh, you, you've done much equine gymnastics in your career. No, I've got to say, I'm, I'm actually really amazed, having heard some of the stuff you just said you can get horses to do. But does it not concern you that if horses were to develop thumbs <laughs> and you've taught them to do all these wonderful things, that they could, in actual fact, take over the world and we could be forced <laughs> to be ridden by horses? Planet, <laughs> planet of the equines. Planet of the well, equines. I don't, I don't think that would be... Well, would it be actually? No, that would be quite a bad thing being ridden by equines. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Or would they, with opposable thumbs, spend all their time on Facebook and social networking sites? Just <laughs> literally, you know. That's true. You know, yeah. you joke. I know they do have hooves, but they have something halfway up their legs, which is a leftover from a kind of thumb when the, when they when they were sort of, oh. I don't know. I guess when they had more claw-like things, and it's called a chestnut. And not many people know about it. Not many non-horsey people know about it. But if you look halfway up a horse's leg on the inside, they have something called a chestnut, and that was their leftover thumb. So, so are, are you telling me that my deep-rooted fear that horses could develop thumbs is actually halfway <laughs> into existence already? The thing is, ca- care for what you wish for. Care for what you wish for. Oh, now I can't sleep again. <laughs> Alternatively, they may be the next stage in evolution. You see, just Absolutely. as dolphins, obviously far more intelligent than human beings, you know. And as Rosie and myself will attest to, what we were saying yesterday, Skippy the bush kangaroo. You know? <laughs> Exactly. Skippy, our friend ever true. Yeah. <laughs> Did Skippy ever make it to America, by the way? I mean, obviously he wouldn't for animal Australian, quarantine rides. I'm familiar with the show, but it didn't come to America. It didn't come to us, yeah. so, so probably just as well, really. Yeah. Maybe, so <laughs> Ed, any thoughts from yourself? Uh, only to um, expand on the definition of horsey and non-horsey. Ah, which yes. Is very horsey. Very good. And I also need to apologise to Rosie because yesterday evening I accused you of being very southern. That's very southern. Yeah. Very which southern. is meant to be a compliment. Why wow, she she was so southern. She was <laughs> she was down with my. She was saying, Ma, what can I say here? It was so it's southern. It's the Texan in me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Sure enough. Anyway, carry on, Ed. You've made that public no, apology, sir. I think, I think that was it. I think <laughs> I'm finished now. <laughs> the difference between horsey and non-horsey. Yes, and the that difference was it. between horsey and non-horsey, or and Texas, very south, horsey, north and south. Exactly, splendid stuff. What does the rest of the day have in store for yourself, Rebecca? Me? Well, I am going to uh, Heathrop Zoological Park today mm. to um, learn a little bit more about zebra training. Yes. Um, hopefully, I'm, I'm going to see the giraffes and everything. There's a wonderful place. It's about it's about three miles from where I'm based. And the guy that runs it is called Jim Club, and he does all sorts of exotic animals. I mean, he has polar bears in the Cotswolds. Can you believe this? It's like, it's like an episode of Lost in the middle of Gloucestershire. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's a polar bear. No, it's black smoke. Where am I? Oh, well, never mind. But I think he's working on, a, on a, an advertisement at the moment for, for a well-known Swiss chocolate company, yep. um, and he's got to teach some cows to dance, so that's going to be fun. So Always we're going to go and have a look at that today. Dancing cows is the next line, oh, I feel. <laughs> we'll leave it there, I think. <laughs> Art. <laughs> it's something to actually work through and, and cogitate on as the world proceeds. OK, we'll be doing a mini photo shoot in the studio very shortly. Rebecca, um, I think I'll ask Jean to throw those last two questions at you. Have you had a reasonably fine, interesting, telephonic yeah, yeah. time today? Genius. I have, and Jean, can I just say, it's such a pleasure to talk to you who actually was on Airwolf. <laughs> <laughs> favorite program yeah. it really was <laughs> thank you so much and please forgive me for writing the letter <laughs> oh, no. I no. Thank you. I so, so, so I, t- I take it becky you actually caught our wolf then did you yes yeah nice it was one of my, it was one of my uh, you know my 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 young program days i absolutely adored it it was adventurous it had a helicopter and everything we we, we <laughs> seem to get it i think on on, on saturday afternoons really but, I mean, saturday you know. afternoon classic yeah i mean I'm, I'm looking at desperate monday at present now in which caitlin attends her sororities reunion but instead of walking down memory lane she finds herself fleeing from cold-blooded kidnappers how true those words are even today, really. You know, you carry yes. on in every sense of the word, but you, you, you still maintain good links with the, 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 the cast and the team, I gather. Yes, one of my kidnappers was Brian Cranston from oh. uh, Breaking Bad, and we're still great pals. And one of the girls, uh, Robin Dearden, was one of my sorority sisters, and she married him. Exactly. So, <laughs> if I, as, as I'm sure, Becky, you'll agree, the only thing that's a little bit sad about Airwolf is we didn't have enough Caitlin O'Shaughnessy. You know, 44 shows, not enough. And even, you know, sometimes you just thought, where are we going here? But superlative titles nevertheless uh, weather of course I mean actually my boy you Chal- don't know Alex 
Alex? Has well, it been it's, repeated? It's, it's, repeated? it's always on, and you can always purchase <laughs> oh, these God. DVDs oh, and, nice. and watch them on that. Old Magnum PI, etc. You know, the theme, as I know you're working on the dance routine, is, 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 is coming in the background. But I'm thinking, actually, Rebecca, would you be up for actually maybe doing a, a choreographed theme to Airwolf for, for, for Randy G? We can, we can maybe get that set out, because we haven't even spoken about your zonkeys, the zorses, the... This is why I love the midweek drive, because it gives me inspiration. And when I finish the zoological park, I will be right back and do a choreographed dance with horses, perhaps a zonkey or two, to the Airwolf theme. I think it's <laughs> a... <laughs> Classic. Yeah, that's rising to the challenge and kicking ass, my girl. <laughs> Genius. Uh, so I take it you will be back. So there we are. Second question asked. Keep on keeping on, Rebecca Townsend. We salute you. Take care now. Brilliant, guys. Have a great day. Bye bye. Mint is on the phone, Alex. And she doesn't have to get up in the morning with her hair so soft and low. There was so much excitement there. You may well have actually heard Rosie saying those words. A minty is on the phone for you. Yes, that's fine. That's because again, the studio discipline was such that you hadn't realised microphones were actually. She doesn't realise now, but she, honestly, it's like this when we were in Dulwich. It's amazing. You know, it's like unless there's an assistant stage manager saying, "Mike's live." <laughs> <laughs> you think it's, it's all right. I'll open up your channels now. It's daylight. Katie and Gordon Lightfoot talking about uh, TV producers and such like, and journalists and so on. We welcome Ian Lennox to the show now. Ian, how are you? How's Newcastle? And uh, why should Randy and Jean make sure that when they're heading up to Edinburgh, they also make sure they check out uh, the joys of Newcastle on Tyne as well? Well, they should certainly try in at St James's Pond tonight because there will be quite a few people there shouting. Yeah, they won't be. They won't be going to see soccer. Uh, it's not going to happen on that sort of basis. But <laughs> I, I, I can tell you, you're very excited by that. Uh, Ina, uh, writer, producer, had a whole wealth of things. Regular correspondent to uh, to the Midweek Drive and, and various other factors, etc. Et uh, we have a critical thing to to work through because, as you know, when we have visitors from uh, the states over, I like to keep spreading that Ian Lennox word. So, I have in my right-hand side a copy of The Sixties Man, a thriller set on Tyneside by Ian Lennox. Kel Adams was bright and good-looking, made for the sixties, but he was bored, and he met a film star, a terrorist, and the tough guy of Newcastle, and suddenly he was surrounded by murder and mayhem. And in my left-hand side, I have The Brothers. 1914, two young brothers from a remote Northumberland village stood at the threshold of their lives. Then came the war, and nothing would be the same again. What do you think should go to Randy, and what do you think should go to Gene? The brothers or the 60s man? Who should go to whom? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, we, we've got, obviously, Gene Bruce. I mean, Gene, Airwolf, top actress, Magnum P.I., St. Elsewhere. You know, share a little potted biography of yourself, really, for, 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 for Ian's sort of benefit at this stage, and the listener. Well, I was on uh, Days of Our Lives, which was a soap mm. in the United States for a few mm. years. Went on to do Magnum P.I. It was Lieutenant Commander Maggie Poole. The legend, Maggie Poole. The legend. In at the start, in at the end. There you go. Genius. Absolutely. Then uh, I was on a show called Airwolf, which mm. was by the same producer, Don Belisario. Mm. Flew airplanes and helicopters and such like that. And then I was the girl of the week on many, many, many uh, uh, exactly. episodic shows. Yeah. Night Ride yeah. and so on. I was fascinated in terms of your first experience of being part of the midweek drive telephonic experience and i hadn't realized it was as traumatic for you as you sort of so share with us what, what was this connection because you know how, what, how did you get when you got with the call through from the, the agent and the, the lines for that so they'd like to feature you on the midweek drive well i'm i'm not very good talking and so i get very nervous and i'm very nervous today in the studio but uh, alex is helping me along here um it helps to be on the phone when i can't see everybody um, but it's uh, it's been very good for me talking to people out and about. So I, I think you are. Know, of course, the invoice for that therapy will actually be in the post yes. too. But anyway, it's all good stuff. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> classic line there. And Randy, over to yourself because I do appreciate, in fact, that you are somebody who will go from your American football onwards, really. But share with us your own acting career because it's crucial to Ian deciding who he's going to do and who's, who's he going to provide the books for. You know, carry on. Uh, country boy, part idiot, 
part athlete. Uh, professor at San Diego. Now I'm a professor yeah, who is funny <laughs> being intellectual. <laughs> 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 but I play one on TV. Um, yeah. I, uh, and, of course, co-founder of Native American Voices. He's a classically trained actor who worked at the Old Globe for two and a half years, oh, so he's oh. got quite the background. Exactly. So there we are. So there's, there's your brief bios. Uh, right. Ian, who should have the 60s men to take back across the pond? Who should have the brothers? Uh, well, mm-hmm. I think, um, is it Randy? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, he sounds um, yeah. academically based. Yes. So you might be more interested in the brothers because it is uh, oh. about the life yeah. in uh, almost historic times of the time of the First World War. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Which leads, Actually, of I can tell you a little anecdote about that. Uh, one of my friends went to, to Zurich and uh, staying in a hotel and the lady who is uh, acting as a, the, sort of the maid um, on a temporary job, I think. Um, saw her, a copy of the brothers lying on her bed and said, "Oh, I, re- I was I was uh, asked to read that one as a student in um, in, in Birmingham, mm-hmm. I think it was." Mm-hmm. So she gave her a, uh, gave her the book. <laughs> so uh, yes, I think, that. and also um, the, the other lady whose name I can't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, Be Jean. Jean Bruce sorry, Scott. I'm sorry, Jean. Well, three names. Don't use them all. <laughs> that's I, I'm exciting. Oh, no, I'm terrible on names. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I apologise. Um, uh, as the 60s man deals with the problems of being famous, uh, and, uh, one resp- uh, and sort of one of sort of subplots to it, mm. uh, I think this film star at some stage says, um, "I thought being famous was one of the rewards. I find it's one of the prices." Part part of, of the job. deal, of course, is that Randy and Jean will need to give full sort of feedback to you too. This one. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. <laughs> book report required. <laughs> Just read the fl- just read the flyleaf and, bu- and bullshit from there. I, I sense a, a seminar, some notes coming through, a little bit of you know discourse coming through on that basis. So they all work well. Rosie uh, obviously will work through that for, for the Peter Kerr routine. Splendid. Okay, uh, Ian, any questions you'd like to put to the team? Because we're back all in the, in the studio again. We have uh, Steve Court, uh, Katie Grimerson, Randy Reinholtz, Rosie Langhorn. Do you remember Legs and Co. Ian uh, Lennox? Do I what? Sorry. Do you remember Legs and Co.? Uh, are they a dance troupe? Nice, Dancers. nice. Yeah. Yes. Do you remember guys? Do they follow Pan's people in England? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah well oh, done. Right. I think um, I, I was. They were on top of the pops. Oh right, yes. Uh, I used to go over there. Uh, I think I was. Uh, not, Which I'm one did you used to go out with, Pete? <laughs> I'm not going to yeah. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Ian Leonard? Ian? <laughs> Ian, it's Rosie. 36 years ago, do you remember? Uh, no. no. I don't want the people. Did you? Yeah. Because Ruth in Pan's People... She said I was the worst dancer she'd ever met. Nice. Oh. Very good. That's always good. It used to be a bonding oh, I probably basis. was, actually. I was terrible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, no, I, seriously? I used to be enthusiastic, but it was like when I danced at nightclubs, it was like a bit like a karate class. <laughs> 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 well, it's expressing yourself, so that's all good for me. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, very yeah. good. Yes. Uh, me, I'm on a crowded dance floor, though. Well, <laughs> so dangerous. So, so, that's dangerous. There's one, there's one girl who said to me once, I didn't know you could dance. I said, Are you drunk? <laughs> <laughs> And that, Gene, is what you call Tyneside humour, because yes. uh, Ian is or what is, is referred to in, in British parlance as a Geordie, uh, which, okay. uh, which means he talks in. He, he was... Uh, he, he's lost the... Jo- it's, God, it's, God, uh, no, it, it, was, it, was, it was evolving, but then it kind of died halfway through. It was like nature decided, no, you can't just... <laughs> just, just don't go there when you've got a Newcastle man doing his whole routine in his whole sort of... Any, uh, what's authentic? Line yourself, Geordie pet. Let's, let's, let's that's talk our way through this because as we as we work through this, Randy might you know want to sort of just break into some Geordie vernacular. What what as they're heading northwards? I used to work in Manchester. And yes, I, I was my party piece was to say, uh, "Ho hurry, ho ya, ho ya." Right, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> With now, now this, 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 ties, this, this ties in with a tale that Rosie's going to regale us with in a few moments. But what I'm doing this is Harold, would you mind passing your hammer to me? <laughs> So let's 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 break it down because it'd be good for Gene for a bit of accent here. So the original line was Ian. Hi 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 Fantastic. That's remarkable. It is. It's quite literally, you know, I feel as though. I've never tried it, you've got loose false teeth. 
<laughs> we just we just work in a whole routine. Uh, well, I do realize that been just except. Steve, anything you'd like to add to 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 Ian at this stage? I'm just I'm just loving it. I just want to hear it one more time. Yeah, one more. <laughs> I think you like this. Not that I want to sort of build up too much, but you love <laughs> Rosie's tale about her Facebook routine. That's even better. But carry on. Carry on. Do you want me to say hi? Yes. Hi, yes. hi, 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 yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> just brilliant. <laughs> that was the Japanese version. <laughs> I was going to say, when, what was amazing is you say it and, and you can tell that it, it's, it's a Geordie saying yeah. it. You said it then twice as fast and it becomes Japanese. And when you get an American person say it, it does sound like a Native American kind of, you could imagine <laughs> dancing around a campfire. It's brilliant. It's, it's a multilingual. It's fantastic. I think it's all go off the United Nations. All the way around the world now, there are people passing hammers left, right and centre. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, last I'm two questions. Stop this, my cat staring at me. Here. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh we, do, we don't want another minty moment, do we? <laughs> we don't want a terrier moment. No, or indeed a Fuzz Aldrin moment. But uh, anyway, let's move on. Katie, last two questions for Ian Lennox, please. Ian, have you had a reasonably interesting telephonic link with us today? Oh, yes. <laughs> I speak Geordie, it's great. <laughs> and can we look forward to connecting with you in the near future? You certainly can, yes. That's splendid then. Coming up next, all well, we should be saying hello. <laughs> to William Sitwell. Round of applause for Ian Lennox, please. Yay! Thank you. in gourmet criticism and foodie delights and the author of a history of food in 100 recipes quite clearly a question of quality personified it's William Sitwell on the Midweek Drive Morning Edition. Yes, so there we are, William, the lady to whom you actually said give that woman her own show has, is all right. It's for all the stuff there, just keeping people praised there in case they were wondering what was happening with the Terriers. How are you, William? So she didn't... Uh keel over or anything no no that's all, all all very positive in the whole system now uh whilst uh, william you probably i don't know do you remember the 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 uh, wonderful world of top of the pops of course i do of do course you, i do, do you, i grew up with listen you know i'm a, I'm a child of thatcher oh well, oh. <laughs> well i'm not i'm an a child not the child <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so uh, i, I grew secret. up in that in that era of great of, of top of the pops and mrs thatcher and in fact I went to this Commons yesterday to listen to two and a half hours of some of the tributes to Thatcher, yeah. to Glenda Jackson's wonderful yeah. um, uh, uh, intervention, should mm. we put it that way, mm. and uh, listened to some very fine speeches. Mm. And uh, there was no mention of Top of the Pops, which of course was one of the key achievements of the Thatcher oh. era. <laughs> <laughs> so if I say Legs & Co, and Rosie from Legs & Co, does that carry with it lots of wonderful, happy televisual memories for you, William? Well, look, every show has its downside. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad of the innovation of the music video uh, managed to protect us from Lakes and Coke. Well. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, Rosie, on that point, wounded, yeah, I'm wounded. Exactly. Let's let let let's move on to share with William. Apart from we we talk about your uh, culinary expertise, because you, you you visited the Jamie Oliver restaurant, did you not? Oh, I did. Yes, yeah. it was my birthday on Monday, and uh, we, uh, my husband and my daughter and I, we live in very near Brighton, and so we visited Jamie Oliver's um, restaurant, which I was pleasantly. Um, it was very, very good. So, in your viewpoint, William, is it is it is it up with Gordon he- uh, with Heston Blumenthal and various other folk, etc.? Would you say, well, he does all right for a kind of blokey bloke? Well, I don't think you can't really compare the. the, the I mean, uh, the, the cuisines and the styles of food that they're doing. I mean, um, I think Jamie's Italian is uh, is a good concept. You know, cheap, cheap, and um, maybe not so cheap, but you know, he's managed to roll out a very decent Italian offering across the country, and he's making money out of it no reservations policy i think which i find slightly tasty i i i I know william you're 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 concerned after the pippa middleton of uh not to make too many uh comments that's going to end up on the national press so we we can i don't i I I think i can say whatever i like as long as it's not about pippa but it's your fault anyway now you say that you know i mean just to sort of say i mean ed what what is he referring to for the benefit of gene and and randy here would you like to just talk us through what what happened and why william said well and this show ended up in the national papers and william in particular was the victim of uh, abuse on in cyberspace 
all because William made a decision that yeah. hits quite within his job description to make. A, a little bit of change, yeah. bringing somebody new on yeah. board, yeah. 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 and all of that. And uh, we, we, were, we were saying how this provoked a really very unpleasant backlash uh, of horrible people using social media to say things that they would never have had the confidence to say had they been face-to-face oh. with oh. <laughs> And that was one of them. That was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> was that William swearing? <laughs> no, it's, it's perfectly understandable. But talking social media, we have to point out that, Ed, you also had a look at Waitrose magazine. I've showed you that. I said, this is very good, isn't it? And you said, it is. Yeah, can I mention the price yes one pound 20 it's fantastic amazing. value you want to get yeah. hold of a copy of this it's and really uh, you know I mean, I'm no cook. I thought it was one fifty, actually. But never mind. Oh, William, William, what's the price of? Uh, wait, wait. Oh, it's it's a wonderful thing. It's it's one it, you, you can't put a cost on on the the joy and delight that, that gave us on the journey to Harlexton on Monday. I, saw, I, I was reading it. You were driving. Exactly. <laughs> Rosie, your social networking media story, please, because oh, this is this don't. is the this is the tale of we're talking about accents, William, and I think you'll appreciate this from from social media perspective. Share with us as as a young mum, and and sort of keeping trendy with what you were doing in Brighton and your response. What well, you I get? have a sixteen year old daughter, and uh, there is a, a little trendy clothesline called Hollister, and there is a Hollister um, shop in Brighton, and uh, it was my daughter's birthday, and I thought I'd buy her a T-shirt or some jeans or something from Hollister because all her friends were wearing this particular label and I went down to the the shop and um, it is very trendy and it's very dark you can hardly see anything and so you have these sort of it's fairly you know sort of middle class middle England and you're going in they've got all these mums who are looking in the dark at the price of a t-shirt that's probably about 85 pounds and a pair of jeans that are about 150 pounds so you said five hundred dollars you know and um anyway I queued up uh, and wanted to pay and I put my uh, card to pay and my PIN number in, which stay, I couldn't see. Stay with see. us, William. It does have a yeah. wonderful climax. And Keep then going. the girl behind the counter just said, oh, uh, may I tell you look us up on Facebook? I said, I, I'm terribly sorry, pardon? She said, oh, may I tell you look us up on Facebook? And I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say that again. I'm really sorry. I can't see you because it's so dark and I can't hear you. Mm. And she just said, oh, make sure you look us up on Facebook. Mm. And I thought, well, why would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Does, have you ever been in, uh, invited to Facebook on that level, William? Because, I mean, obviously, we, we are Facebook buddies. Is, is that something which resonates, or you just think, this is outrageous? Well, you know, I, I, I remember when your uh, particular request for friendship came along, and yes. it was, put me in a very awkward social yeah. dilemma. You know, <laughs> <laughs> which, which obviously, my instinct is to ignore. Yeah, yeah, but I know. I thought that might rather put a, cast a rather dark cloud over the mid-morning... Well, live thingy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that we, yeah, the show. Mm, yeah, so there we are. Big bonded as So I, I think I, uh, yeah, I, I decided to accept, but I do get sort of, um, I don't know, hundreds of uh, requests for friendships and I ignore them and then occasionally I sort of think I'll accept every single one of them, <laughs> and uh, which is probably a mistake. I mean, I regard Facebook as a sort of friendly uh, arena of social media, and then I, and t- whereas Twitter is the more hostile. So I feel I can sort of, uh, I'm feeling Facebook kind of among friends. I'm sure that's completely the wrong judgment to make there. Fascinating. And for the benefit of uh, Randy Reinholtz and Jean Brew Scott, who are making their way around the country and going up to, to Scotland as well, what sort of cuisine should they should they be checking out? In fact, I'll, I'll take this further. Will you, Jean, would you invite William over to California to maybe lend his gastronomic genius to sort of the Californian food experience? Absolutely. Why not? Oh. Well, I like actually, say, I'm coming. I'm coming to California in June because my book uh, is being uh, History of Food is being published um, by Little Brown in America in June. So I'm touring. Uh, I'll be in San Francisco in the middle of June. So uh, you know, uh, ask Alex how you become a social media friend of mine, and we'll work it out. <laughs> <laughs> Any friend of Alex's oh. is a friend of yours, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, I, I, he, he didn't respond to that, obviously. I, can, I, 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 I do have a question for William, yes. though. Since we're headed to Edinburgh, can oh. you give us a recommendation for a, a restaurant that we should check out? Oh. Uh, in Edinburgh? Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> oh dear. <laughs> there you go. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll deal with the anxiety. No, I think it's very, it, it shows oh, a balance. Dear, Dine on the train, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> take, your, take your own haggis. Uh, anyway, if you, bring, if you want, bring your own sheep. Uh, anyway, other other exciting things. We'll, we'll work our way through that. Uh, anything else you'd like to raise, William, with the team? Because so we have a uh, fantastic he- uh, hextet of, of fine folk in the studio at present. Well, I tell you, I tell you, if uh, if uh, your folk are bored of the village of Lincoln, Lincoln, come Friday, mm. go up to Scarborough because I'll be appearing in the Scarborough Literary Festival. I'm doing two talks, one about the history of food and another about the, the Sitwells, who are well-known in Scarborough. You see, already you've raised the reason, has, has, hasn't he, basically, Steve, as to why he should be an essential part of Lincoln-inspired 2014? Yes, he has. <laughs> yeah, sort of put, put that whole thing through then and we'll work through that whole thing. We'll, we'll see Scarborough as like a warm-up to next year's Lincoln-inspired. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to think that, that that's sort of working through that. So, Randy, would you like to throw those last two questions to William Sitwell before we obviously uh, pass it over to, uh, to, to Gene and he can have an off-air chat about life, the universe, and, and uh, restaurants in, in Edinburgh? Randy, over so, to you. Uh, William, have you had a reasonably interesting telephonic link with us today? I, I think so, and I think it's precursor to the Lincoln Literary Festival, of which I am determined to be a centrepiece. Hmm. And then can we? It was look? only Lord Melvin Bragg who effectively usurped you this time round. But don't worry, you know. Yeah. I walked past him in the street yesterday. Unbelievable! You know, should have <laughs> taken him down. <laughs> the power of coincidence. <laughs> Page thirteen, Melvin Bragg, Grace and Mary, seven p.m. Lincoln Drill Hall, and that sort of system. Just literally a days before we actually do fifty years of Doctor Who. Terence Dix, Graham Harper, Richard Franklin, and a Dalek, which I'm hosting as well. And of course, today, don't forget, dear listener, you can come along to the. Uh, uh, MC1001 a room and Randy and Jean will be in conversation with myself which is always nice yeah, it's always the fun. Oh, happy. I'm a native, native American voices etc so the next question of course is what can we look forward to connecting with you in uh, yeah. soon <laughs> <laughs> I think the response to that is, is uh, I'll, I can give you I'm going to give you an extended response to that um, my grandfather had a a uh, housekeeper who worked with him for 70 years. On the third week of her employment, my grandmother wrote in her diary, gave Gertrude her notice, sad but inevitable. <laughs> she was still there 70 years later. So my answer to that question is, sad but inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> This is the Midweek Drive Morning Edition on Siren 107.3 FM. Quite right, too. And the weather today for the Lincoln and surrounding areas. Highs of 6 degrees centigrade, lows of 4 degrees centigrade. It's going to be cloudy uh, with rain and drizzle spreading uh, northwards. But the good news is over the weekend it's going to get much, much better and uh, all sorts of exciting things will be taking place as well. OK, uh, time for something we don't usually hear at this time as far as midweek drivers are concerned. From LA to Lincoln and via sirenonline.co.uk to the world, it's time for the midweek drive to connect with investigative filmmaker and planetary truth seeker the one, the only, Phil Leonis. It's all right, Randy and Jean. We will be getting a similarly exciting jingle, and I don't for your good self. Good, good morning, Phil. And what is it like now? It's zero dark two. Well, zero dark oh three in Los Angeles. How is, how is it like? I mean, is Los Angeles coping with uh, both Randy Reinhardt and Jean Bruce Scott being out of the state? Barely. I mean, that uh, their absence is the only explanation that I can think of for why my cat, Buzz Aldrin, would immediately, upon the conclusion of the midweek drive last night, would uh, ingest uh, an entire stargazer lily, which is the most toxic and poisonous substance a cat can eat, and uh, so I've spent the, the day in the uh, animal hospital watching my tiny little cat be put on an IV drip uh, where it will stay 48 hours. This is, this, is, this is 
desperately sad news in every sense of the word, including the fact that Rosie could hardly hear anything from that point of view, but hopefully we're all connected together on that base, which is fine. Are we, are we all clear on that? Would you like me to turn the volume up a bit more? Sorry, anyway, fine, that's great, splendid. A little bit of uh, various other bits and pieces. I don't think Ed's actually got any sound at all, so I'll sort that thing through. The shock is, is resonant in every way. Katie, have you got any words of wisdom for, for Phil then? I mean, obviously about Fuzz Aldrin, because I know we all love Fuzz. Uh, here's the cat, by the way, that uh, we've seen. There. So, um, yeah. Katie, um, anything? I hope he gets better soon. There we are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's the kind of magic that sort of works our way through the whole process. Now, uh, obviously, last night, uh, Ed, we appreciate you were devastated that I chose to stand up at the crucial moment when Rosie was actually doing the full dance routine with Katie and so on. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever forgive myself for that, but I was just trying to obviously <laughs> provide the, the whole yep. essence of things from there. Uh, other than that, I mean, did that help with the trauma you were going through on Wednesday? Well, of course, that, that, you know, it was, it was downhill from there because, I mean, that, all right, sorry, that's sorry. really yeah. it all started. That's really <laughs> when it all started. But that's why I prefer film because in film, as a radio, of course, we would get a take two. Mm-hmm. And take two, you wouldn't stand up and block the webcam no. uh, during the uh, <laughs> high point of the dance. Yeah. It's a very difficult, challenging routine. Listen, Phil, it's over to your good self. I mean, I, I was privileged to be together with Ed uh, at the Harlexton College on uh, Monday, and uh, we had an absolutely outstanding uh, production with uh, Randy and Jean in conversation. And hopefully, we'll uh, we'll actually we'll like, carry this through into uh, the time later on today because Katie's going to be in the audience. Ed will be as well, so that's at least three of us who'll be there, which is good news from that. Um, Phil, whom would you like to speak to first? Will it be the legend that is Gene Bruce Scott? Will it be... Because you've actually seen one of Native American Voices productions, given that when we talk about Native American Voices, Native Voices at the Autry, you know exactly where it is in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah, well, yes. Well, it, in fact, is not in downtown Los Angeles. It's in the, the beautiful Griffith Park, mm. uh, the largest public park in all of uh, the, um, the United States. There we are. You see, that's, that's that's right. So, have you actually met? Because I know, I think you spoke. Because we exchanged various details in this no. morning. You haven't. No. So it's, it's, it's okay. no, only electronically. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious. I'm curious to know how audiences differ for their shows uh, in the UK versus, say, uh, the United States. Okay, uh, Gene. Do you want to, oh, right. Well, Gene's pointed to Randy. Randy's pointed to Gene. We, we've both got microphones, so in fact, we might swing this this other one round as well. So you've got full full force on that basis. So right. well, actually, uh, we went to see the Winslow Boys at the Old Vic, and the, here in London, and we were surprised at how diverse the audience was. There was cultural diversity, age. It seemed also economic diversity, and that's what we have at Native Voices. A lot of times, it feels like. When you go see theater in Los Angeles, the audience seems pretty homogenous. Everyone drives a certain kind of car, comes from a certain part of town, blah, blah, blah. And the the uh, Native Voices audiences are really, really diverse, young, old. It's not unusual to see children there with their mothers. And we have a, a large Native American population because of the subject content, about 30%. One point that astonished me uh, from what you were talking about with the students at Harlexton on Monday was you, suggest, you, you pointed out that uh, uh, back in the 90s, uh, a significant number of Los Angeles people actually thought all Native Americans were extinct. Is this true, Jean? Yes, they, they did a survey when uh, people were exiting the museum, oh. and uh, they, they asked and they said, well, yes, they vanished. They vanished. The vanishing Indian, yeah. I mean, Phil, were you aware of this of this phenomenon? You know, did, did you? I mean, when you wonder anything, Native oh, no, Americans, no, no. they'd all w- gone. Was I aware of the uh, Was I aware of the phenomenon of Americans not knowing yes. things? Yes, <laughs> I'm, 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 I bump up against this. Uh, I bump up against this all the time. I mean, th- you know, there there is always these studies that are done of what the average American doesn't know, and uh, I wish I was joking about this, but. You know, one in three Americans can't find the United States on a globe. Oh, they boy. can't. They can't locate it on a globe. And of course, most of those uh, go on to become pilots for American Airlines. <laughs> so it's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you see, this is this is just. It, it, I mean, does the, at Randy, do you kind of sense a kind of resonance in this? I mean, sometimes I mean, we're, we're delighted that you're over here, but sometimes you think, never, never overestimate the audience. You don't know where they're coming from. We were talking to Pre- Principal Kingsley at Harlexton Manor and saying, "Wow, everyone knows history over here in England. They're, everybody's telling us the history every time we go see a house." And he said, "Well, it's the people you're meeting." 
maybe not everybody oh, knows the yeah. history. It's the people you meet and encounter. So I tend to think that's the way our world works uh, in Los Angeles. We meet people who invariably know more than us. But, yeah, I think if you do your homework, you can find a lot of idiots out there to be friends <laughs> with. <laughs> well, you know, in, in Los Angeles, it's interesting because the history of Los Angeles has been so forged by people who came to this city to escape their own personal history, to, to even create a new identity for themselves. And so it's kind of unique in that way. And sometimes I think that that's the explanation for why in this city we seem not to know our own history very well. How could we? We're all fleeing a history from somewhere else. And we've always tried to have a different history for Native Americans than the one that actually came because you it's were, embarrassing. You were, you were there quite a long time ago. I mean, the Choctaw Indian were, were there before even Phil's Norwegian uh, ancestors decided to actually say, right, you know, it's boring with the fjords. Let's go to the States. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they necessarily said that, Phil, obviously. I don't think I was there at the time, but they might have, you know. It's, it's, it's a rosy. Thoughts Hello, yourself. Alex. <laughs> you know, as, as I say, Rosie, in many ways, we are the fulcrum which this entire show is actually in base. Axiomatic to the whole principle, as mathematicians would actually say, without us starting this whole thing off back in Dulwich Radio Land. In, a in, very long time ago. Well, yeah, last century. Uh, 30 odd years when Gene hadn't even started shooting Airwolf. <laughs> you know, it's that length of time. These guys wouldn't be here, you know? Oh. So I think it's only right. Would you like to ask any questions to Phil, who's a relative newbie? But we were talking about how did people get involved with the show? And we obviously shared about how you were know, part of the Legs and Co team, or the whole set that we connected Which they won't have a clue about. They, they won't I, even know what that, that's about. Ask Phil. Do you think? Oh, what's that? Right. I or understand. Randy. <laughs> Randy. Phil. <laughs> that's our gene. Good who? job. <laughs> well, the good thing is radio. Yeah. Are we on the camera, though? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, it gets caught. Exactly. I get caught. No. Um, hello, Phil. Hello. Hello, my name's Rosie. Mm. Yes, Rosie. I <laughs> I listened I listened to you on last night's uh, midweek track. Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> oh, well, my, you know, I don't I can't say that that was anything other than wonderful since my lady <laughs> was a part of the show. So it was uh, Oh, was that um, Lily? Lily. Lily. Yeah. I really liked Lily. Mm. In fact, afterwards, uh, Rosie could speak of little else other than when is Lily coming over to I the did, British actually. Isles? You know, it's the key, key point for that point of view. There's something about Lily, Phil. There's a, some sort of depth and, mm. I don't know, she, she just thinks on a different, uh, in a different way, doesn't mm. she? She's great. There we are. And very beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so onwards then, Rosie. Any, yes. any other questions you'd like to put to Phil? Or perhaps Phil might have one or two questions uh, for yourself. I mean, we were starting. Did, had you ever come across Legs & Co.? No, you wouldn't have come across Legs & Co., Phil, would you? Well, I mean, if it's the legs and co that I enjoyed on tops of the, t top of the pop, then I would have. There you see. That, yeah, you see. But, International. Yeah, you're American, aren't you, Phil? <laughs> I am, but I like to consider myself a an international citizen of the world and <laughs> nicely uh, put <laughs> and as alex and as alex knows uh, for me all musical enjoyment begins with paul weller and the jam and uh, as a boy growing up in the states i would get my hands on recordings of top of the pops whenever i could really yeah. i mean jam used to come in you you're know, nodding obviously. randy is this, is this something you echo as well from that point of view oh yeah the music that came over that was that was the cool thing to listen to wow. and the dance routines that rosie sort of put together with various i wasn't dancing yeah, was too that, much or i was dancing by myself oh well, yeah, that's always the way <laughs> there were some fantastic bands then absolutely fantastic yeah but i i, I remember the jam coming in quite often because they used to have a lot of hits and Paul Weller then, I would go into the studio and watch them. Oh. And you just knew they were going to well, be so and, big. And The Clash. I mean, yes. I think they did some numbers with The Clash. And maybe even, unless I'm drastically uh, just imagining it, um, uh, even a, a number, at least one number that I can remember with the Sex Pistols. We did. Yes, with yeah. um, chocolate revolvers. Yeah, I, I did think that was a moment where you kind of went postmodern, Rosie. <laughs> you know, Is mean, it possible? We, we got Steve caught in, in the corner. Steve's going to be performing for us in the studio in the second part of power. But Steve, you know, legs and co and chocolate revolvers. I mean, from from your own point of view, that was was that was that where the, the shark was jumped, or, or do you think no, no, it's okay. It's they're just being existential. The, I, if I'm honest at this point, a lot of this conversation existing somewhere about three or four feet above my head. <laughs> yes. Um, but 
Well, I, I, I know Alex. the clash and I know the jam. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, that's through my dad's record pot- collection. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> There you have it, the young voice of uh, Steve Court there. That was <laughs> fantastic. It's brilliant. Anyway, uh, YouTube, that's all I will actually say. Uh, I think we've managed to, to uh, draw that line neatly put under the whole thing. We've still got Peter Kerr with Song of the Eight Winds coming through. Uh, any final questions you want to put to either Gene or to Randy or the team or Rosie, Phil, Leonis? Uh, yeah, uh, Gene, Randy, have you had the uh, great good fortune of having uh, Alex drive you to the cathedral yet? Not yet, but Alex had the great good fortune of being kidnapped by Randy hey, hey, whoa. And, and made U-turns on the A1. So, <laughs> Ed, you were there oh, as well. well. You know, this was ex- this this was high energy, high octane, white knuckle ride stuff. This was <laughs> whoa, <laughs> right hand drive. Yeah, Randy, just talk. Because we've had no Gene. You know, yes. as, as, as wearing the Caitlin O'Shaughnessy air wool. So, I mean, what, what 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 was he trying to do there? You know, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. I'm usually a very good co-pilot, but at that moment, I was just hanging on for my life. <laughs> It was Aggie's so, so, so there we are. Ag- I, I was Aggie told, told him. Yes. System. Yes. Exactly. Uh, the answer is no, but Rosie, <laughs> Rosie has been driven by me as well, and vice versa, but obviously not in, the, not in the last century, etc. I mean, Rosie, you, you quite, I, mean, I haven't kicked you up to the cathedral, obviously, but it's, something, it's obviously rankles with Phil Dearness, you know, that's, that's a key no, thing. No, I think you're a very good driver, Alex, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, very good. Nice views of the cathedral. Yeah. Took me the scenic route yeah, around. They, very, yeah, very yeah, well, yeah, that's the point. That's the point, is that it really is the scenic uh, route. If you're in a hurry to get up to the cathedral, just walk. walk yeah. the <laughs> uh, but not yeah. as I hear up steep hill yeah. Yeah. when it's snowing. No, precisely. <laughs> it's precisely. slippery up there. Yeah. Just in case you're wondering, of course, we're also here to promote this. Lincoln Inspired is more than just an arts festival, more than a literary festival, more than a whole set of lifestyle opportunities, and more than what the world has needed for millennia. To see just how much more Lincoln Inspired can make you, go to lincolninspired.co.uk and explore the inspiration. Oh, yeah. No, so, uh, Rosie, I think you worked splendidly. What did you think of that, Steve? That's the first official revealing <laughs> of the Lincoln Inspired jingle. I feel like I could cry a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Were you welling up? <laughs> I've got proper teeth. I'm welling up. <laughs> I pass the brochure across for Virginia and Andy to peruse as we work our way through that whole side of things. Phil, did, did you get a sense of, yeah, there we are, that's what it's all about? Yeah, indeed, I wish I could attend. Yeah. Uh, oh, you, you, Phil, you, we wish you were here. Well, exactly. Because there's ever such a lot in here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you, you'd have to stand, Phil, but you'd be more than welcome. It's always yeah. a party, isn't it? <laughs> it's a morning. Oh, you know, in Los Angeles, it's midnight. It's getting better all the way. Ed, would you like to throw those last two questions to Phil Leonis, please? Yes, good morning, Phil. Have you had a reasonably interesting telephonic link with us on the show this morning? Well, Ed, as you know, generally when I make my appearance, I'm in pyjamas. So it's certainly been interesting to be fully clothed for an installment of the Midweek Drive. Hmm. Moving on from that, can we look forward to doing this again? It will be Wednesday, won't it, next week? Oh. Yes, it'll we... be back in my usual, uh, what, what, what would Attire. that be? Would that be 6.30, yeah. 6.30 p.m.? <laughs> I think yeah. we're looking at 6.30 p.m., 6.35, or of course in L.A. time, 10.30 a.m. Or, or as you like to say, half 10. Exactly. There you are. It's, <laughs> it's splendid. Uh, last little task for your good self then, Phil. Uh, Sylvester LeVay's classic Airwolf theme or London Calling in the Clash. Where are you going to send the listener? Oh well, Whoa. you you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Lo- uh, London calling uh, right now, yeah. but you should really close the show with yeah. the theme from Airwolf. Well, yeah, I th- yeah, I, I, I think that's that's just it's good to go in every sense of the word from that point of view. And and might I say, uh, Rosie should lead a dance number during the theme from Airwolf. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure then. Given that you never heard the theme out from Airwolf no. in, in your entire life before, it's all right. Hey, but, well, what's new, Alex? I've been now. in the deep end for the last twenty-four hours. I'll but give, you I'll, have I'll, from from now till the yeah, end of the show. It's true. Prepare, I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you thirty seconds, just basically, so you get a sense of, of the kind of excitement that this fantastic series actually worked with on the forty-four shows that featured Caitlin O'Shaughnessy. Yes. I'm thinking, Rosie. Remember Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and I Fanfare do. for the Common Man. Yes. Similar kind of vibe, all right? Anyway, more from that later. Uh, Now, The Clash.
So much to fit in, so much to actually do, and if we've got just if we've got one, two, three, we've got four awards to talk about. We've got the uh, North Yorkshire Fell and Working Terrier scenario. We've got Duncan Blacklock from Country Life Signs, etc. But now, Jean, Randy, Rosie, Katie, Steve, and Ed, we are ready for this. Keeping up to date with Beady the Wonder Horse, Dudley, Lola, Angel, Buster. Tarka, Misty, Jess, Fizburn, and other animals on their tour of the countryside. It's Minty Steed on the Midweek Drive Morning Edition. Who, as we say, Ed, is inspirational in her own way, is she not, Ed? Yes. She is. Good morning, Minty. I might switch the microphone on. Now. That's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, for a moment, I just didn't even. I opened the channel up, didn't switch the microphone on. The fake no, mistake. I was going to say, and Packer was all ready to take over and back the program through for me, and uh, you just held him on too little too long offline. There, you, you lost his nerve. That, that's quite all right. But as I say, the good news is, a few years ago, basically, well, actually a year or so ago, we decided to actually actively support on both Southside Broadcasting and Siren FM terriers, working terriers, dogs and dogs mm-hmm. and bits and pieces, and yep. they've been going in for various competitive things. Minty, yes. would you like to take the story further and explain how Dash, of course, uh, donated via Olga, has actually yes. come up and done the business, as well as actually it has indeed, capturing yes. judges' trousers? Yes, oh yes, yes. Yes, no one will ever forget that that's actually followed this process through about uh, poor uh, Bob Gibson and uh, yeah, Dash inciting a riot of terriers to attack him yet. Indeed. And, uh, Sadly, yes, we don't have four hours to tell the story, so can we, we move on, we please? Don't. Indeed. So we go straight to the Dash being the protagonist of that trip and issue and the mother of the champion puppies. Uh, she made her own actual debut in Show World Copper, and uh, she thoroughly enjoyed it. She gave a spirited show. She backed all the way through, and everyone knows she was there. And uh, she did Olga proud. Uh, she really did. Um, she uh, she showed herself off well, and she t- taken to it like a professional veteran of the show ring. And she's done well, and we're very very pleased. And all together, the radio team of terriers, even though it was very much a working terrier show, uh, we accumulated four awards and a splendid little bronze trophy. <laughs> I always like to feel, Rosie, that it's good if you're going to work with terriers, they've got to be champion terriers. And yes. uh, we, we go on to national circuits now and yes. on to even all sorts of things. Randy, from the point of view of the Choctaw Indians, uh, terriers, I mean, did they ever make cross the Atlantic? We're, we're big dog people, the Choctaw people. And Jeannie's making biting Jean's noises. Making at some me. extraordinary sure biting. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Oh, I hate to say it on the air, but it's puppy stew. Puppy stew. <laughs> Yeah, fine. Okay, thank you, Jean. That's, uh, that's, this could be a whole new world. Don't worry if Tarka or, or, or Dash are actually listening. It's not a case of if in this business you're either a winner or your dinner. We won't eat you if, uh, if you want to go too far down that line. Is Mark Kinch joining yeah. us? <laughs> <laughs> You heard that. Yeah, yeah. And you don't get that on BBC Radio 2, I can tell you. No, you anyway. do not. You don't. You don't. Not even on the World Service. No. no. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so let's move on then. Obviously, success, yeah. success from that point of view. A uh, Derbyshire correspondence yeah. will be checking out the event that you're going to this weekend, which is uh, in Tatton. So what's, what's happening there? It's at Catton Park in Derbyshire, mm-hmm. run by Embraceway, yeah. who, of course, runs the Lurcher and Terrier racing uh-huh. uh, and uh, the shows there, and we're going to do our best over the weekend. We may do one day there, and then we may go down to Newbury for the Sunday uh, to do the All About Dogs, uh, run by the Aztec people, and uh, we're very much looking forward to whichever we end up doing. Just, uh, just want just, to hold you there briefly, Minty, because I do know that people often confuse, particularly after our marathon, run by the Aztec people, nothing yeah, to do yeah. with our uh, end-of-the-world Mexicans. No, absolutely but, not. But, no, no, based firmly in the uh, more ethic boundaries of this world that we have, yeah. uh, but uh, the idea, I think, came from the Aztec was, I think, a combination of a chocolate bar that used to be on the go many years yeah. ago, and the idea, of course, Aztec does have a certain resonance to success 
when they were very successful and uh, the events certainly are successful. So uh, perhaps a little sideways thinking, but definitely came up with a, a good name. Exactly, exactly so. Yeah. OK, uh, and travellers, because obviously Jean and Randy, they've, uh, I mean, you, you, you've been in the UK before. I mean, Jean, you've got Scottish yeah. ancestry and various other factors as well. You're making yeah. your way northwards to Edinburgh in search of flowers. Marvellous. Yeah. Optimism yes. and American spirit. It's great. Absolutely. Stuff, yeah. So that's going to be it there. Uh, well, uh, Minty has just been in touch with somebody who, uh, bes- despite being uh, disabled, has actually sort of uh, taken part in quite an extensive train journey around the country. Just a brief mention yes, for that, indeed. please. Yes, he has. Hayden Fletcher. Um, I need to go. Oh, not loud. It's always it's the excitement. You know. this, is, this, this, is, this is actually Rosie. What must be like every, re- returning back to Top Pop Studio because I know many of the audiences were just like these. You know, the floor managers would try to get them in order, but and the that, DJ that, don't get me started on that, please. You know. <laughs> yeah. We, we, yeah, we're losing you, Minty. We, 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 we are losing you on this other thing. Are they, are they, tell them to breathe. That's the important thing. Right, shh. Yeah, yeah. work with children and dogs. <laughs> and, and relax. Okay. Um, so, I, I tell you what. I tell you what. As they've got, as, as they've got carried away now. Oh, we've got a moment's time. No, you're right. Alex, <laughs> 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 oh, with comedy timing, the dog's kicking again. Here we go. Yeah. I, think, I think at this stage, yes, doggy, in woof language, you've had an interesting telephonic chat. And yes, the terriers will return. Ain't he? It's been but splendid. Not on your so. program. <laughs> no. I can only liken this, Alex, to, to the studio. Minnie's trying to hold it together and she's just got a pack of wild animals disturbing her. And it's a bit like yeah, you here, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and I think uh, it's, it's the others one half jack in this town who's taking them for the top after the mop this week. Um, okay. It's just a very we- quickly say that um, Fran of yes. the Yorkshire Game Fair yes. and offer a free ticket Excellent. and free hospitality to We'll be there, York we'll be sort of... It's, the this studio, is, yeah. if we come back in May for, uh, to see the Yorkshire Game Fair. And this is what uh, it's all about, <laughs> exactly. A little plug for the Yorkshire Game Fair. Ed, we were speaking about it only yesterday. We were saying we will actually yeah. be there and sort of through. Katie. Yeah, lo- for your guests as well that in the studio. Uh, exactly. It's, it's, uh, yeah. The obligation is that and if you haven't been to a Yorkshire Game Fair, well, yeah. I'll tell you, it's a part of your life you need to... And right, we've got away. something special you haven't known about yet, Alex. We're going to put you into an, in, an outdoor cave. Splendid. It's a huge replica of a cave. We're going to put you in, and then we're going to see a hollow ditch come in, out. In, into an outdoor cave or an outdoor cage? This could be well, crucial to so, uh... well, it could be. It could have turned up to me like, feeling like a cage if you don't find your way out. It's a complete replica of a cave, and the blade it is enormous, and it's going to be part of a new hall. And you go into it, and then once you're inside, it's just like being in the real underground cave. And you go to different light levels and all I of think that. It's the one and uh, I thought it'd be cracking good fun. Uh, uh, it, if it'll, be, in. it'll be, it'll we'll be, yeah. Back. <laughs> exactly. Katie, <Okay, laughs> last two questions. I will send Dash, we'll send Dash in yeah. to get. No, no, leave the dog. Leave the dog outside. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get. I'll get out myself. Katie, last two questions, please. I that was yeah, you off. exactly. Yes. Um, Minty, have you had an interesting telephonic link with us today? Well, I think Dash and the corresponding terriers have yes. And I think Dash and all of them have enjoyed um, taking part and taking oh. over this slot. Yeah, nice. There are some people and I cannot mention. Yeah. And can we look forward to connecting with you in the near future? Well, I hope so. Then I can mention all the people I would have been mentioning had not the Terriers take over. Bring on the red Ferrari. Still to come, we have the delightful Peter Kerr, who'll be talking about uh, the Scottish joys of his texts and writing and a whole heap of other routines. But now, as ever, on a Thursday morning... ...of international who's who to CNN, from film criticism to royalty, from South Africa to London, and now to the midweek drive on Siren FM, it's Richard Fitzwilliams. Yay, Richard. How are you, sir? Well, I have been looking into the details of where a state funeral 
deviates from a ceremonial funeral. Ah. I know you needed to know that, but of course... Well, well uh, not only that, but of course, as you rightly said before we, uh, we came on, uh, you've also been listening to Ra- The Adventures of Jean and Randy, Randy and Jean, in the UK. And also that question, as you rightly said, when you captured it from our, our little interview we did at Harlexton Hall, why isn't Lincoln known more to tourists? Isn't that what you said, Randy? Why isn't Lincoln known more to tourists? In, in Absolutely. It's the... It's gorgeous, and there's so much to see around the cathedral. There was the a castle. time. There was a time this morning when we honestly thought you'd gone to Lincoln, Nebraska, as opposed <laughs> to Lincoln, England. But you, you hear, Jean, your thoughts on this whole thing? This is much prettier than Lincoln, Nebraska. Right. Yes. <laughs> they have no cathedral in Lincoln, Nebraska. The cathedral is majestic, isn't it? Because I mean, it it really does dominate. Oh, it's fantastic, and it's the, the it's the whole village around the cathedral is also quite delightful. So we we had a great time. Went to the castle. Went to the cathedral. See, we call it a city in the oh, south of the Atlantic. Yes, I mean I, I know in America it's it compar- it's a little village. It's a you know, village. But, you know, it's, it's it's a minor point. But I mean, Steve might have one. Yeah, you know, Lincoln is fine. It's, 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 it's I mean, you know, Edge. Would you, it, it, would you see it as a village or as a, um, a, a, a the people who live in Balegate see that as a village very much. Oh, oh well, that's all right. Well, you, I'm not sure if anybody who lives in the city has ever been there. Right. So that's know, fair enough. up that hill and all that. Rosie doesn't like the hill, do you? <laughs> <laughs> She's all, 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 all very critical. Okay, so uh, share with us then, Richard. I mean, obviously we had uh, the, uh, the the news this week. Sad to some people. Uh, uh, of, of uh, dubious sort of uh, worth to others, etc., of Baroness Thatcher's p- passing. I have to say that uh, Principal uh, Gordon Kingsley at uh, Harlington College probably summed up the, the moment just before we spoke to the students on uh, Monday, really, about the views. And, and Jean, your, your thoughts on the passing as, as an American of uh, Baroness Thatcher? Well, Kings, Dr. King, Kingsley said oh. it well, oh. is that uh, she was... Uh, was Time to go, and uh, she she was probably ready to do it. So, uh, we should be happy and and say great blessings to her on her oh. journey. There we are. See, there's a distinction, Rosie. You'd echo that? I, I would. You know, um, whatever your thoughts are on her, um, there needs to be a bit of respect, I suppose. And uh, yep. yeah, and, and Randy. <laughs> Pass, pass. That's fine. It's the, see, that's the. It's you, difficult, isn't it? Anyway, o- over to over to yourself, Richard. I mean, obviously, we're sorting this things through. Parliament are debating her legacy today, which I think is an extraordinary side of things. We've talked about it at length on behind the headlines with Richard Keeble and Brian Winston and company on, on Sirens. So, you know, wh- where, where do you sit in there? Have, have Al Jazeera and CNN been on the phone saying, you know, what's happened? Has the Queen died? You know, what, what's working on that basis? Is it that stage that we're at? What, 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 what's your view as royal correspondent? Well, um, the royal interest is, of course, that the Queen is going to be attending with the Duke of Edinburgh uh, the service at St. Paul's. And, I mean, she's only done this for Sir Winston Churchill in 1965, and he had a full state funeral, and that involved lying in state for three days and a particular um, series of routines which won't be occurring here. Other than that, There's no question that uh, what is going to occur next Wednesday uh, will be a magnificent display of uh, uh, British pomp and pageantry because it will be orchestrated by the person who was behind the Queen Mother's funeral, uh, Sir Malcolm Ross. And little doubt, we've seen, as as you've all mentioned, there is tremendous division when it comes to the top of Lady Thatcher. Uh, the particular aspects of it that I was asked about was uh, were those dealing with state funerals, which heads of state have, but also there have been a dozen individuals from Sir Philip Sidney to Sir Winston Churchill who've had the honour bestowed on them, and also this matter of a ceremonial funeral, which the consort of a monarch and the likes of uh, Lord Mountbatten and Diana, Princess of Wales, get. There's no question at all I was riveted. Uh, I speak as someone who used to haunt um, Parliament because I found it so theatrical. This admittedly was in the 1970s when the government had a very small majority, and you really did have spectacular, colourful debates. And I was even there when Hesseltine waved the mace, which is unforgettable when they started fighting, quite literally. Mm. I mean, it so really you, is... You, you don't get it in the House of Representatives or the Senate House, because, of course, you don't have a mace. But as I said, Randy and Jean, if you could part of this whole thing of let's get the colonies back to where, you know, Britain obviously sort of had them, etc. We could say, okay, you can have a mace. You yes. know, you could have Newt Gingrich or company <laughs> actually ho- holding that mace. 
when he was Speaker of the House, obviously. They haven't done that? No. Uh, <laughs> it seems as though they have. I don't think they'd understand it was symbolic. I yes. think they'd actually <laughs> Flintstone each other. Uh, that well, yeah, exactly. It's a whole range of things. Like Randy, I, think speak, I, think, I think debates in the House of Representatives and the Senate are very, very different from the bear garden that we have here. But <laughs> yeah, <the> yeah. <laughs> order, order. Bring in the terriers. No. Um, <laughs> Brandy. I mean, theatrically, Parliament can be absolutely fascinating, but I have attended um, debates in Congress, and I mean, this is, it's a totally different world, mm-hmm. and a very, very different way of, of doing things. I think that the, the parliamentary side, when there's a tiny majority and you've got a knife-edge atmosphere, it can be very, very interesting. This is a long time ago, but I used to slip into the public gallery. You only had to arrange this at the last minute, and you could get in because you knew that whereas I had a packet of peanuts and didn't care about dinner, others used to religiously leave about half past eight or eight o'clock. And between nine and ten, you had these big set-piece debates, and it was... The noise, the theatre, uh, Michael Foot uh, very often spoke, Michael Heseltine. So, you know, it really was very, very interesting. I, I just have this vision here of the uh, the editor of International Who's Who with a packet of peanuts in the gallery thinking, <laughs> yeah, they, well, said, they said, what? You know, you know it's like... Feed, feed popcorn in the coat. Before you queued, before you were let into the house and oh. queued, and they would keep you going for what was... But I knew it was going to be good theatre, oh. and sometimes you've got to queue for good theatre, and I don't necessarily mean the Winslow Boy, which I haven't unfortunately yet seen, but you've recommended. I would like to know if you've seen the audience. They yes, we did. We did. Oh. We did. And okay. was, what did you think? It was it was quite amazing. Uh, we didn't know a lot of the inside stories for for the different prime ministers, so it was great to see Helen Mirren as the Queen. Uh, and to learn all about that and to learn about Wilson uh, and actually Major, we... It felt private. There was something did. about it that really captured what the privacy must have been like between those leaders and the Queen. Yes, I thought this was absolutely marvelously captured by Peter Morgan's screenplay and uh, as Dolby directed with such panache. It's mischievous. It's yes. wonderfully funny. I don't want to... Sp- no spoilers, but when mobile phones ring or when uh, uh, perhaps, shall we say, sleep intervenes, you know what I'm talking about, of course, and it, or certain beasts appear, yes. uh, it really <laughs> works. Just come Very away much from so. those beasts, you go into the cave. And the tenderness, There's, there are moments of tenderness that are breathtaking. <clears throat> I love the way that the Queen reminisces with her younger self. I thought that worked so well. A very clever it yep. really, really had the audience. I saw, I saw it in the preview, and at that time, Robert Harley was Churchill. And he was absolutely vintage performance. It's so sad that he's no longer with the production. But I don't doubt Edward Fox, a first-class actor, um, does very well. In fact, I remember him as Harold Macmillan in a letter of resignation. And we're talking about former prime ministers. It's quite interesting to remember the extraordinary variety that we've had looking over the last... Uh, say, 50 years, and it's, it's, it's really interesting to see the idea of the audience, because it could have been very contrived. Uh, the one comment I would make uh, is the portrayal of Margaret Thatcher by Hayden Gwynne. It, when Thatcher stands in that suit, I found that there was something that somehow appeared very contrived about her. I couldn't see her swinging a handbag. It was. I know that it was perfectly obvious that we were looking forward to the clash between two strong-willed women. But I didn't find the portrayal of Thatcher convincing. If you want, for example, a good villain, which is basically the role she had in that play, you must have somebody who carries conviction. You must humanize them. And that, I did think, was the one flaw. But having said that, Mirren was magnificent and the that was a standing ovation when oh. I saw it. Do you know, it's exactly a standing ovation every time Legs & Co. had done a performance. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or Guys and Dolls. <laughs> Same sort of thing. Rosie, does this, does sort of, do you think, uh, are you going to be setting out a little trip from Brighton to go and see Helen I've got Mary? tickets. Well, I've got. Yeah, well, it's in May. So, I'm so. really looking forward to it. So, and uh, particularly to see Helen Mirren. Really of course, it is crucial because whatever Richard might say, ultimately I go by the Rosie Langhorn approach. <laughs> <laughs> Physical in every sense. Um, yeah. Looking forward to, to seeing it. Exciting. Would you like to throw those last two questions to Richard Fitzwilliams, please? Ed. Morning, Richard. 
Good morning. And can I ask you if you've had a reasonably interesting telephonic link with us on Siren at 107.3 this morning? I've enjoyed it enormously. We haven't got to place no. beyond the pines, well, no, which I'd no. hope to. It's but, all right. Uh, you know, Lincoln is fine next week. We'll have to, I think we're going to have to open up another weekend link for you, good selves, Richard, so carry on. And can we look forward to connecting with you again around about this time next Thursday? Uh, yes, because I was hoping that, in fact, we could also discuss compliance, that the oh. Milgram experiment, oh. uh, how individuals respond to authoritative voices. That oh. has been fascinating exactly. with our current company. The power of the voice. Company. Yeah. So, do you want to just tease ahead to that? I mean, Miranda, you might have one or two thoughts on, on this. I mean, as we talk about Native American voices, you know, Richard and, and the voice, what, what, just, just uh, lay, lay a little teaser for us. What, what, what are we talking about in terms of this experiment? Well, the idea of the film, directed by Craig Zabel, uh, which deals with a prank caller who pretends to be a police officer, telephones the manager of a fast food restaurant and says that one of her employees has committed a crime. It's absolutely chilling and it deals with the way especially when you're busy somebody intrudes in your life they represent an authoritative figure this is of course pretending to be a police officer giving you instructions what you do what people will put up with what they will actually do if they believe an authoritative a figure of authority is telling you to do something threatening you cajoling you or whatever and I, I was absolutely fascinated by this uh, film. Sounds interesting. Katie, does that appeal to you at all? Yeah, I can't wait to uh, yeah. listen you, to that. You ain't got <laughs> no authority. <laughs> Steve, you know, school authority things? Yeah, definitely. Happen. I think there's, there's a lot of miles in, in exploring that sort of stuff. When yeah. you look at, like I say, I work in a school at the moment, oh. and sometimes just the way you say something to a class... Oh. Oh. Instantly, you cultivate, get a reaction from that. Cultivate the verbal whip. That's mm. what I found very useful. <laughs> cultivate, <laughs> cultivate, cultivate the verbal whip. You don't always whip. need a stick to beat people. No, with. exactly mm. so. Just, you know. But the, the chilling thing was, it was based on true events. Oh. That there were numerous uh, such occasions where, in fact, this uh, this worked, and it does make enthralling viewing. I, I was impressed. We've Atmospheric so, so too. So, Randy, does this appeal now that you've actually had a bit of backstory in terms of this? Will you be checking this little piece out when it, uh, when it crosses the Atlantic? A little man dressed in brief authority. Yes. That's how I think Shakespeare puts it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Very exciting. Um, so I take it then, Richard, you return? I most certainly hope so. <laughs> OMD, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. And no, we haven't forgotten Cameron Tilbury's Million Dollar View tune, which will be featuring before the end of the show as well. But now it's another special, wonderful time, because I think it's fair to say, Randy and Jean, when we connected with you over the Myathan time uh, and you were having to get over San Diego's American football loss, you were brought back to life by the performance of our next guest, who's ready to perform for us now in his own Lincoln-inspiring manner of ways, etc. Steve, Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to do two pieces now well i say we're going to do two pieces i've just been discussing the fact that i'm doing this from memory so we might get i don't know half a piece maybe two pieces maybe one and a bit of a piece but we'll see what happens um the first one i'm going to do is one that i wrote quite a few years ago now and it's a nice little rhyming poem and it's about a guy's experiences in the trenches during the first world war so we'll see if we can get to the end of that six in the morning and i'm making tea i'm making breakfast for bill and me it's not very nice. It doesn't taste good. But then it's hard when everything's caked in mud. 6.15 and Revley's called. Get out of your beds, ah, the sergeant bawled. 6.30 now and we're standing proud. And once again the sergeant's loud. Right then, boys, today's the day. We're going to make them Bosch pay. Then comes the captain to add his bit. I suppose he's the caviar to the sergeant's spit. OK, brave boys. Then I heard the penny drop. We've waited for glory. Now we're going to go over the top. Now, I don't think that sergeant or captain are thick, but I'm armed with a pistol and a small pointy stick. I know I've got two legs to run, but I don't rate their chances against that Bosch machine gun. But my protest seemed to fall on deaf ears as captain finished his speech to whooping, hollering cheers. Nine o'clock now, and the gravity hits. The men's cheers are tears. The atmosphere, the pits. I've turned to reading a letter my brother had sent. They were his last, final words. Now I know what he meant. You see, my brother went over, and what did we gain? 
Six foot a trench in the pouring French rain. Hardly seems worth it to have just thrown him away. But then they roll the dice, and we have to pay. Because you see, the big man doesn't care so long as we win. And why should he care? We're just numbers to him. We're tiny little numbers just stamped on our arm. We're little battery soldiers from a little battery farm. It'd be over right now if we had a chance. Because not one of us care if we own a piece more of France. But then the lives of so many are in the hands of so few. And they're power crazy, reckless and clueless. What can I do? I'm court-martialed and shot if I try and reason why. But do as I'm told and just... Well, just run out and die. It's eleven o'clock. On the 11th of November, 1918. And I stand here convinced this is the last day I'll have seen. For I'm poised on a ladder at the bottom of the rungs, just waiting for the silence from those big battery guns. But then a messenger appears. Um, Sergeant Quick, uh, before you leave. Could this be it? My final reprieve? Not now, boy. We're poised to attack. I'll read your little note when me and the boys all get back. Then Sarge blew his whistle, and we went at one hell of a pace. But he couldn't dodge the bullets on this final death race, and now with bullets, shells, and shrapnel flying, and all around me good men dying, back in our trench, that unopened note read, Call off the charge, the Great War is dead. I think that's a round of applause. <laughs> we got to the end. Outstanding, outstanding. Do you wish to do another one? Oh, yeah, we can do one more. I think we can squeeze one in. Okay. Um, the next one we'll do is one... I, I set myself a challenge probably about a year and a half ago now. It was when the, the, the London riots were going on. Um, I set myself a challenge of saying I need to write more. So I said every day you're going to spend at least half an hour, even if what I write is a load of rubbish, you're going to do half an hour's worth of writing. And then the next day I'd sit and I'd review yesterday's writing. I might keep a word, I might keep a sentence, I might keep an idea, and then I'd do another half an hour's writing. Um, day one of doing this approach to writing, I sat down on the train and I thought, right, now's the time. Couldn't think of a single thing to write about. So I thought, well, we'll use the paper. We'll open up the paper, and whatever we open the paper on, that's what we'll write about. And uh, I opened it up, and it was a big uh, speech on David Cameron's Broken Britain. And I thought, mm, maybe a bit heavy for day one. We'll have a look at what the front page says. So I closed the paper up, and there was a massive picture of the London riots. And I thought, okay, still quite heavy. Uh, uh, maybe we'll just read the sports pages. So I flipped it over onto the back, and England were coming up for it. There was something about England. There was a, a three lions crest on the back. So at which point, I had this ridiculous conversation in my head with myself saying... No, you're cheating. So as punishment, you now must write something called Three Lions that includes David Cameron's Broken Britain and is about the riots. And this is, this is what came out of it. We waited. Breath baited as the masses congregated and the police just segregated our communities. With actively passive policies, they fed the hatred like disease. Like life on Mars, a nostalgic trip back to the 70s and jaws dropped. As not with credit cards, but bricks they shopped. As politicians lilos and loungers flopped and the trouble instead of ending was spread, not stopped. And yet the leaders still holidayed. And the nation was left dismayed as the innocence costs rose and our price was paid. And the first of our three lions was slayed. It gasped for breath and died in pain. Whilst the money put aside for rain money. bailed out Greece, Ireland and Spain and we can't keep the police we need. That's just plain insane. It's mad. And the Prime Minister blamed the absent dad in his latest speech on his latest fad like state in Britain's broken mattered. Britain isn't broken, it's shattered. Its morals and identity scattered. She's like a bride on her wedding day flattered but the relationship soured and that bride got battered. And no one seeks the truth. Because if you don't blame the absent father then you blame the youth and you don't need a detective or a TV sleuth to see what's in front of your eyes. It's not a secret concealed by spies. It's not of micro science size. It's as plain as the nose on your face. And it's infected every creed, colour and race in every hamlet, town and city in every place. Yet under the carpet went the shame and disgrace. And under that rug the rot set in, breeding an underworld culture of vice and sin. It's retailed at one ninety nine in a tin. It oozes trash culture like an overfilled bin. And it's a fight, if uncontested, it's destined to win. But the nation was left dismayed. As the innocence costs rose and our price was paid, and the second of our three lions we slayed. All just to steal a phone, that magnificent beast was cornered alone and left to die ten feet from home, leaving an endangered species of one. And all hope for the future with him was gone, because it's not just the setting, but the burning out of the sun. It's a tragic, tragic end to what started as fun. For what started with a bang's gone out with a spurt, leaving a wake of destruction and a lifetime of hurt, and all the trust's been eroded like the length of the skirt. But it's time for the reign of confusion, to broadcast to the world the illusion that we're a proud nation of social inclusion. Yet we 
were treating a severed limb as a contusion. And round that severed limb the tourniquet tightens, as this to the poor enlightens, but the rich it frightens, for they can see the blood, not the cut. And for as much as they see, their eyes remain shut, and they're sick to their stomach, but they don't have the gut, so they open a window and leave the door shut, leaving no entrance for the exalted. No way for the rock to be halted, it's a commitment from none, so none can be faulted. And left alone... Our final beast is assaulted, and the nation is left dismayed, as the innocent's costs rise and our price is paid, and the third of our three lions is slayed. And so departs the last of his kind, now just the emblem left to remind that we should clean out the filth and don a collective mind, remove all that's broken and with what's left behind treat it for ailments and pains, clean up the waste and remove all the stains, unlock the shackles and chains, and tenderly and passionately love what remains. Your million dollar view Your million dollar view Keep searching for the truth and your million dollar view That was Colleen Loy, the Cameron Tilbury musical selection for this week What you want has no bearing on whether or not you'll get it None, not a zippo It's only ever a question of whether or not you can behave as if you already have it I got you, babe, the universe. Quite right, too. There we are, Mike Dooley there, our uh, regular inspirational guru. So, Randy, we're just uh, privileged to be in the same studio as uh, the fabulous Steve Court, who you can catch uh, the uh, Lincoln uh, Inspired Festival on Sunday, the 11th, or 12th, in fact, of, uh, of the month. The Lyric Lounge presented by Writing East Midlands, 11 a.m. through 6 p.m. at Lincoln Drill Hall. Unleash your inner poet and performer as the Lyric Lounge returns to the Drill Hall. What did you make of it? Was it as good over in the studio live as it was when you were listening to it over in the States? Well, I'm a live performance person, so I love to see the performer because I, I like to watch the eyes and where the mind is going as the words come. Uh, it's sort of double the poetry. Excellent. Jean? Well, I, I would like to get him over to the U.S. because I'd hire him in a second as an actor. Right, He's wonderful. Well, you know, we'd, we'd like to feel we set the boys out in all sorts of ways, etc. Rosie? I think it's fantastic, outstanding, oh. really, really good. Katie? I thought it was brilliant. I love the concept of both the poems. Oh. And Ed? Yeah, I just love the energy in that. Really, really good. I think it was very good indeed, yeah. Steve. That's why Thank I asked you for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Three funny bookings in LA. I know. <laughs> <laughs> And we thank the Terriers, Minty Steed, Phil Leonis, uh, Richard Fitzwilliams, Peter Kerr, Rebecca Townsend, Ian Lennox, and William Sitwell for uh, helping us through the last uh, start of, of the day. Ed, have you enjoyed the programme? Certainly have, thank you. Good. Jean, have you enjoyed your first official two hours here as a midweek drivette? I never want to leave. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Rosie, how's it been for yourself? Because I say yesterday was the first show we'd done in over 20 years, in the studio, that is, as opposed to telephonic links. I know, yeah, Today's yeah, the second. It, it, like it, buses, really, isn't it? <laughs> 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 All come at once. Yeah. Um, I've really enjoyed the time. It's been great. Okay, so back again? Yeah, definitely. Good. And Randy? I'd love to come back. Brilliant. And you, the show okay for yourself today? Did you pass muster in terms of variety and I, we concert? We had cats. We had dogs. What yeah. more could you ask Horses. For? Horses. 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 <laughs> Donkeys. Exactly. Donkeys, a whole range of things. Like that. Katie? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I'll be back next week. Hey, good. Again. And uh, Steve? I loved it as always. Well, there you are. It's all going to go. Don't forget, as far as Siren 107.3 FM is concerned, we continue with the goodness and uh, music and a whole variety of other bits and pieces. To Rosemary Langhorn, Jean Bruce Scott, Randy Reinhardt, Ed Wellman, Katie Grimmison, and Steve Court, many thanks indeed. Give yourself a round of applause. It's wonderful stuff. Huh? It's amazing. Excellent. The news is coming up from the Sky News Centre at 10 uh, a.m. And then, of course, uh, lots of magic. Jess will be with us in uh, the later part of the morning doing a whole heap of other bits and pieces. We could squeeze in a smidgen of music, but I figure, well, it's only going about 30 seconds, so we might as well just talk through the, the whole sequence, etc. Why should people go to Lincoln Inspired, please, Steve? It's in the title. It's Lincoln Inspired. There's something for everybody, whether you're into books, music, film, 
theatre, whatever it is that you like, there is something for you there. So come along, check it out, lincolninspired.co.uk. And next week it's a Lincoln-inspired Midweek Drive Morning Edition takeover. Lots of uh, artists uh, will be with us in the studio together with Sarah Bullenmore as the magic will continue ever onwards. Arthur Weingarten is back on Wednesday, as indeed is Ilana Rain, as indeed is Louis Savvy from Sci-Fi London, Phil Linus and a whole heap of others. Can we all say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Bye-bye.